and uh, we want to welcome people into the family of God. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you. You are faithful. You are awesome. Thank you for what you did earlier. Thank you for what you continue to do here. We continue to surrender every part of our service to you. Holy Spirit, this is your church. It's not mine. It's not ours. It's yours. And we want to see you move. And so we will do whatever it takes to see you do that in this part of Maine and in this part of the world. You are faithful. You always visit us, but we thank you, especially when you visit us with your power. We ask God that you would just continue to move in a powerful way. In your precious and holy name, amen. Today, we are talking about something that affects every single person in this room. Family. Family. What, what is a family? That's the question that the Manchester, New Hampshire Fire Department uh, ventured to uh, ask us when I worked at the nonprofit I worked at. What, what constitutes a family? Because there's a tremendous frustration right now in fire laws all over the state of New Hampshire and I'm sure Maine and everywhere else because people can't seem to agree on what constitutes a family. Is it a group of people living together with a common purpose? Is it a mom and a dad and kids, or a mom and kids, or a dad and kids? What, what is a family? What if it's a mom and her sister and kids, or a dad and his brother, or his friend and kids? Is that a family? Well, the fire department couldn't seem to agree, and we used to fight with them all the time about the fire codes in New Hampshire because we had a lot of people all doing the same thing, working together, and really operating similar to a family. I wonder how you define family. Is it just your birth relatives? Is it the people that you gave birth to or were put in your life? Uh, in fact, I can ask you a question and no one will be able to raise their hand. Who here picked their family of origin? Oh, not a single person. All right, fine, I'll make it easier. Who picked their ethnicity? Oh, none of you. None of us get to decide any of that stuff, but we serve a God who does. He intentionally gives us the family, and when I say family right now, I'm talking about the collective family that you were born into or is part of your life. Now I have a question for you. Have you ever considered what Jesus has to say about family? Because I really hadn't. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't, uh, it's not something I had studied or considered until this week when he put this on my heart, and he has never done this to me, at least since I've been here. And so I guess the first thing I want to say to you is, I repent in front of all of you. Because I think for the last three years, I've completely missed the point of church. And I know that sounds silly, but it's true. When we got here, there weren't many of you, and God has slowly grown it. And that's been really fun to watch. It's been hard. It's not an easy thing to go through. Growth hurts. That's why my kids always want Tylenol at night. But it, it slowly growing. But I think the reason it's slowly growing is because God was waiting to get me to this point. Welcome to the family. That is what God wanted me to understand. George and Joyce started coming here right in like the middle of the pandemic. And they would come here and then they would go back to their church up the road. And then they'd come here and they'd go back to the church up the road and they still do that. And I remember asking George, what do you, what do you, why? Because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't understand. And he said, well, I feel like I still have family there, but I have a new family now. And I don't want to leave one to be part of the other, which I thought was a wonderful answer. But it always kind of sat a little weird with me. I didn't really understand the depth of what he was saying until now. Until I started studying what Jesus says. If Jesus is God, which I happen to believe he is then I think I should be able to surrender my view of family to him and take his interpretation of a family and let that rule every step I take in my life. And I think you should do the same. Go ahead, Nick. Here you go. Here's your extensive Bible reading this week. We're going to really get into the Bible today, except not really, because we're going to talk about two verses. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. In one sentence, the God 
of the universe completely redefines family. One sentence. Now, of all the people on earth, Jesus is the only one who got to pick his ethnicity, got to pick his family, got to pick his gender. He's the only one. Every other one of us hasn't been given that choice. Jesus picks his family perfectly. He has a mom who has carried him to term perfectly. He is born into the earth and lives life perfectly in front of his brothers and his mom. He is the oldest of his family. The fact that this doesn't speak about Joseph is a reflection of the fact that he's probably dead, according to most scholars at this point. Jesus is the oldest Jewish child of a mother and brothers who are standing outside trying to get his attention. And he says, who are my mothers? Or who is my mother and my brothers? I wonder if we ever ask that question. I think if we saw each other as family instead of a group of people who collectively come to a place to learn about a God we all agree on, then things might be a little different in the way we make decisions, in the way we use our resources, in the way we think about one another, in the feeling when someone doesn't come to church for a while. I think all that would be different, wouldn't it? See, I believe after studying this and praying about it and now ruminating on it all week, that church is not supposed to be a group of people who come and learn about an amazing God, though that's a wonderful part of church. Church is supposed to be like the greatest family reunion you get to attend every single week. When's the last time you came to church and got excited to see somebody? When's the last time you came to church and thought to yourself, man, I love that Jess has a different ethnicity than my family and I want to learn about it because that's awesome because she's made in the image of God and so am I and I grew up completely different than she did. She's from Alaska. Are you from Alaska? I didn't think so. No, I'm from Massachusetts and ain't nobody want to know what it's like to grow up in Massachusetts, but Alaska, that's pretty cool. We have bears there too, but they're Bruins and they're not very good, right, Nick? The point is, <laughs> this should be a celebration every single Sunday. Should be, according to what Jesus says. Now, Don, who is our friend and also family from Auburn, uh, does something that I'm stealing for church. I'm going to talk to the board about in the next few weeks called Family Dinner, where she organizes all her kids and she organizes everybody else. And we have dinner once a week. You know what the agenda is for those dinners? Because I don't. Nothing. There's no agenda. You feed one another. You sit together. You just live life with one another. And I realize that as a church, we can all come here. We can all agree on the same things. But if we don't love each other like family, we'll never grow. And it won't be because Jesus can't do it. It'll be because our hearts are not in the place he needs them to be so that when people come in who are really hard to love, when people come in who don't fit or belong, when people come in who look backwards and act backwards and react the way they always have because that's all they've ever known, it's going to be real hard to love them, isn't it? If our mindset is backwards. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. Well, as the oldest Jewish man, his mother is his responsibility, isn't she? You would think he would rush out and say, what do you need? You're Mary, the mother of God. Some of you who are grown up in church are surprised she didn't float into the room and, oh, it's, <laughs> where's your shell thing? Uh, the <laughs> Mary was his mother. She was someone he picked and he denies her in this moment. There's a crowd of people around him and his family can't get through the crowd. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get to Jesus by using their position and their relationship. The interesting thing is the people Jesus ended up fighting against the most were people who used their position and their relationship to God. So it should come as no surprise that when they say, hey, they want you, he doesn't jump and move and do everything they want. Really, if you continue to study this passage, what you find out is that they want him because they're concerned about him. 
They're concerned about him because they think he's gone crazy. They think he's gone crazy because he's gone off with 12 other guys and they're just traveling around talking about God and healing the sick and stilling the storms and everything else. So what I would argue is, well, their motivations are good. Their intentions are wrong. Do you have family like that? Family who has a desire to see you become something. And so they do everything they can to get you to do it the way they think it should be done. And you can never seem to measure up to the expectations they place upon your life. Do you have family who are always criticizing your every move? Nobody here has a perfect family. I'm sorry. I know, Gene, you don't believe me, but it's true. There are no perfect families, but there are people who serve a perfect God. And I can tell you just from walking through what I've walked through in my family, going from having screaming fights with my mom and hating her with everything in me to loving her and not having anything negative I could say about her, going from uh, complete disrespect and utter, utter disregard for my father and how he lived his life and the decisions he made to nothing but respect and honor and loving him. And I'm saying that in front of you, but they know God has changed my heart that way. I can tell you God, when he gets involved perfectly, can take things that are broken and fix them. He can take families that are completely spiraled out of control and restore them. He is no respecter of persons, the Bible says. But it might make you wonder, why is it that the family has gotten to this point? I think the answer, whether we like it or not, is us. The answer is humanity. And why is it humanity? Because from the Garden of Eden, which was as perfect as it could be, to God flooding the earth, there are nine generations. Nine. That's how long it took for humans to go from a place of utter perfection to a place so devastated and evil and wrong that God said, wipe it out, start over. Nine generations. I don't know about you, but my background <laughs> is a reflection of decisions my family has made. Whether you grew up in a trailer or a house or didn't have a place to call home, whether you had family gatherings or you didn't, whether you spent time with family or not, do you know that today as a Christian, if you're truly born again, you have the privilege to do something that you will never get the privilege to do another time in your life. You get to pick your family. And not only do you get to pick your family, you get to find your family. What is it like to be surrounded by a group of people that love you and are constantly trying their best to look out for your good? I don't know because that's not the family I grew up in, but it's the family I want to cultivate here. It's not the family that I grew up in. It just wasn't. And it probably wasn't for you either because most of us have all kinds of great memories and traumas and hurts from our childhood. And yet God says, this is your family. Which means it's a lot harder to be angry at one of you, when I know your family. Because blood is thicker than water. That's what we all say, right? Oh, blood's thicker than water. When we moved to Maine, I've told you this many times, but I'm sure there's at least one person in here who doesn't know, but probably not. When we moved to Maine, we had no family up here. None. In fact, this was moving us further away from all our family. No family, no friends, no connections, no nothing. There was nothing. And God has given us family that is greater than anything we could ever imagine now. And it's come slowly. And it hasn't been easy to open up. And it hasn't been easy to love people like family. And yet the reward for doing it is so great. That is why when they say, Jesus, your mom and brothers are outside. Why don't you go out and see them? They really want to see you. He says, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it and obey it. What he's saying to them is, my family is right here. They're right here. Do you know that you are part of the family today? I used to think it was so strange. The uh, Bible college we went to used to be very old-fashioned, and when my parents went there, because they both did, 
uh, they would call everybody brother this and sister that, and I thought it was so weird until I realized that it's not so much supposed to be a title as it is a relationship. Oh, so my dad used to say, oh, Brother Blondo, what do you think about this? And we all used to laugh at him because that was one of the, <laughs> one of the teachers who was the cool one. And he used to have everybody just call him by his last name. Oh, Brother Blondo, I thought it was so weird. And yet, it's not so much a title as a relationship. So I want to show you a few things uh, from a book that I really love. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's by a man named Pete Scazzaro, which is a really fun name to say and a really hard name to spell. Our families are the most powerful group to which we will ever belong. Even those who left home as young adults determined to break from their family history soon find that their family's way of doing life follows them wherever they go. What happens in one generation often repeats itself in the next. True in your life? It was true in mine. Oh man, this person struggles with alcohol. This person struggles with finances. We'll get into all that. So this is, this is what it says. The consequences of actions and decisions taken in one generation affect those who follow. For this reason, it is common to observe certain patterns from one generation to the next, such as divorce, alcoholism, addictive behavior, sexual abuse, poor marriages, one child running off, mistrust of authority. Pregnancy out of wedlock and instability to sustain stable relationships, etc. Scientists and sociologists have been debating for decades whether this is a result of nature, our DNA, or nurture, our environment, or both. The Bible doesn't answer this question. It only states that this is a mysterious law of God's universe. What is he saying? He's saying we are shaped by the people we are born into. We are crafted and molded. Can you think about certain people in your family that might use weird words and then you start using weird words? Because when I first moved up here, you know what I didn't say all the time, but I say all the time now? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We never said that. That wasn't normal. That wasn't a New Hampshire thing. And I, I know it's only two hours, but I'm telling you there's a difference. And it's a good one, I assure you. Don't go two hours south. The reality is that we never said that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, my brother makes fun of me more now than ever before because I do that. I'll be talking to him, I'll be like, oh, yeah. He's like, oh, you're all. <laughs> Back to Florida. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about a few different parts of your family that maybe you've never reflected on, but I'm convinced Jesus wants to shine some light on for you today. Go ahead, Nick. Number one, money. What did your family teach you about money? Money is the best source of security. These are some common misconceptions or things that might have been taught to you. The more money you have, the more important you are. Make lots of money to prove you made it. I wonder how many of us have been defined by what our family taught us about money. Oh, well, if I just make enough, I'll finally be able to prove to everyone how valuable I am. It's interesting how many people make millions of dollars and have no family. Interesting how many people have everything you could want materially and nothing spiritually. I think Jesus calls it what? Sell the, sell, sell the whole, none of you know the verse? What does Jesus say? Oh, the man is cursed who sells his soul to gain the world. That's the Adler paraphrase. Go ahead. Conflict. How do you deal with conflict in your family? Do you deal with conflict in your family? Do you live in a family where maybe you don't talk about conflict? Here's the first one he lists. Avoid conflict at all costs. You ever try to reason with someone like that? It is infuriating. Oh, well, I know you offended me, and I know I'm hurt, and I know we could restore our relationship, but you know what? It never happened. We have some people in our family. I won't tell you who they are. You can speculate all you want who do not ever address conflict. And when you bring it up, well, you are on the phone with them, they go, okay, well, I gotta go, and they hang up. <laughs> oh, I'm sure something really important happened at that very moment of conflict. But we don't even realize we do it. Most of us don't even realize the things that have been put in us from our family. <laughs> don't get people mad at you. I don't know about that one. That's never been a problem for me. The third one 
is absolutely how I was raised, and it's my comfort zone. Loud, angry, constant fighting is normal. In my house when I was growing up, we did not have some really nice Hallmark dinner. Norman Rockwell would have had a field day in our house. Nobody's slowly reaching for the, no, we are grabbing, we are talking over each other, we are loud, all of us are loud, except my sister who hid in her room. She's an introvert. <laughs> she, I don't know how she survived. But we would talk over each other, and then it wasn't so much a conversation as much as two people talking at one another with the hopes that something would get through. Maybe that resonates in your family. But man, my mom and I would get into these big fights, screaming fights. And then usually I would walk outside and slam the door. I remember one time I swore to her, that was a mistake, and uh, hid in the woods until my dad got home. And then had to brush my teeth with soap. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Nick. How did you deal with conflict? Sex. Sex is not to be spoken about openly. Men can be promiscuous. Women must be chaste. Sexuality and marriage will come easily. These are all misconceptions. These are all things that we've been taught by our families. Some of us never got to have the sex talk with our parents. Instead, we just kind of gleaned whatever we could from our friends who had no idea what they were talking about, but I'm sure they knew what they were talking about. And you would sit around and talk and fantasize about what sex even was and why it was something you couldn't do according to the Bible if you weren't married and all these other things. And the reality is God created sex to be a beautiful gift to married couples. And the reason he wants it to be in a marriage is not because it's some perfect structure. It's because there's protection for everyone involved. And it's supposed to be a reflection of what he does in us when we become Christians. You enter into relationship and you are united as one. And when you have sex, you are united as one. It's not taboo or wrong to talk about it, but we never do, do we? The Bible's full of stories about sex. We don't talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. We have to pretend that no one here has ever had sex and all the kids downstairs, it was a miraculous thing. Uh, you know, immaculate conception, all of them. It, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it in groups that are healthy. We don't have healthy conversations about it. Sexuality and marriage will come easily. I want to tag on that for just a moment. That's a lie. <laughs> if you've ever been married more than, I don't know, two years, that's a lie. It's not easy. You have to work at it. You have to make time. If you have kids, you have to lock doors and put baskets in front. Because anyway... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Grief and loss. What did your parents teach you? What did your family teach you about grief and loss? Sadness is a sign of weakness. You're not allowed to be depressed. Get over losses quickly and move on. Did you know, on average, when someone loses a spouse, they say you should be able to remove your wedding ring after a year, one year. Doesn't matter how long you were married. Doesn't matter how your relationship is. One year, you should be able to pull your ring off and you're done. And I'll never forget, I heard a sermon by a man who I had deep respect for. He was a teacher at my school and he started crying while he was talking about his wife who had died from cancer. And he said it took him three years to take his ring off. Three years. Just because it's what you always did doesn't mean it's right. Just because it's what was modeled doesn't make it secure. It's okay to grieve and it's okay to process loss. Sadness is not a sign of weakness. I wonder how many men in here heard when they were growing up, you're not allowed to cry. Don't cry. We don't cry. We're men. We don't do that. I know at least Nick did. It's fine. You can all pretend like you're the most sobby people. I know there's a lot of emotional men in this church, but there's also a lot of men who probably haven't cried in 20 years you got your tear ducts are so blocked up with salt, you uh, look like the roads here in the winter. That's fine. It's not wrong to cry as a man. It's not wrong to cry as a woman. But what did your family teach you about it? Because many times, our family doesn't teach us anything about it. We have to figure it out as we go, right? All right, go ahead, Nick. Expressing anger. <laughs> here you go. This is fun. None of you are angry people at all in this church. Anger is dangerous and bad. Explode in anger to make a point. Sarcasm is an acceptable way to release anger. 
I'm sure there's nobody in this church who struggles with being sarcastic. He said in a sarcastic manner from the pulpit. (laughs) Sarcasm is a curse. I am completely convinced. I used to be the most sarcastic person you would ever meet. And what I learned is that the closer I got to God, the less sarcastic I became. It was the weirdest thing. But it's almost like there's a disconnect and we don't realize that the two are connected. That your outlook on the world is expressed through your sarcasm. And whether you attempt to or not, you paint a picture for yourself or the people around you that things, not only are they not good, they're never good. I remember, speaking of men crying, (laughs) when I lived in Mexico, I was there for three months. It was the greatest time of my life except coming to this church. I had to slide that in for you. When I was there, there was a group that came from Massachusetts. I had been there for probably eight weeks at that point. And this group came from Massachusetts. And so the director said, oh, I'm going to put you with the group from Massachusetts. It'll be nice. You'll be with people from home. And they were the most sarcastic, (laughs) bitter, angry people I had ever encountered in my life. At least it felt that way because I realized when I left New England, not everybody's mean and sarcastic. (laughs) That's not the normal in America or in the world. That's just where we happen to be. These people were bitter, they were sarcastic, they were mean, and I went to the director's office two or three days after I had been with them and started crying and said, please don't put me with those awful people. It's like, but that's where you're from. That's your home. When God removes it, though, it starts to affect you a different way. I also want to highlight what he says about exploding in anger to make a point. Anybody have family members like that? You can't have a civil conversation, and when you attempt to have a civil conversation, they feel like the only way they can make their point is to explode in anger and slam a door. I know nobody in here would ever do that. But it is something that many of us were taught. Go ahead, Nick. Family. What does family mean to you? When I was growing up, family was whoever was in our house at the time. We had people sleep over all the time. We hosted dinners all the time. It was all incredibly normal incredibly consistent. What does family mean to you? My wife's family, complete polar opposite of mine growing up. Her family was incredibly private. They, she's, Vicky had like three sleepovers her entire childhood. You can feel bad for her, it's okay. <laughs> three sleepovers, no one ever talks about anything. You never tell anybody what's going on in your family. They're still like this so many years later. You owe your parents for all they've done for you. Don't speak of your family's dirty laundry in public. Duty to family and culture comes before everything. How do you define family? We saw how Jesus defines it. Go ahead, Nick. Relationships. Don't trust people. They will let you down. Nobody will ever hurt me again. Don't show vulnerability. Anybody believe that stuff? It's funny. It's like the more you've been hurt, the easier it is to believe these, isn't it? That when God starts bringing people into your life to help you and strengthen you and build relationships with you, it can be very hard to build relationships with somebody who's been hurt many times. Very hard. Once you're through, you're through and it's fine. But getting there can be a real challenge. Sometimes people are hard to love. Go ahead, buddy. Attitudes toward different cultures. This is a fun one. Only be close friends with people who are like you. Do not marry a person of another race or culture. Certain cultures, races, are not as good as mine. Now, I thought this was hilarious, so I will share it with you. If it offends you, I apologize. When I was growing up, my brother and I knew that our grandmother was slightly racist. She would never admit it. She wasn't like overtly racist, but she was definitely slightly racist. And I remember thinking it was the funniest thing. We would sit at the table usually on like Thanksgiving, and I go, Grammy, how would you feel if I married a black girl? And I'll never forget her answer, because if my daughter said that to me, I'd be like, oh, no big deal. (laughs) I think that's great. If that's who God has for you, and that's who's serving the Lord at the time, great. And my grandma said, well, I'd think you could do better. I'll never forget it. It was normal to her. That's how she was raised. That was her culture. Guess what? We're not taking that one down with us. That's not going to my kids. They don't get that one. That has been placed in some of us. 
Oh, they're weird because they do it different. Oh, they're not as smart because of this. Oh, they struggle financially because they waste all their money. It's easy to look at other people. And because humans tend to be very tribal, when someone comes in a room who looks different, everybody notices. There's a part of you that's on alert. There's a part of you that's slightly worried. Being in uncomfortable situations can be very, very stressful. And yet, Jesus is surrounded with people from all different walks of life. Every one of his disciples is uniquely different personality-wise, skin color-wise, background-wise. There are some that are Jews. There's Simon, who's called Niger, and he's called Niger because that word means black. There's Thaddeus, who we don't know, like, anything about, but if you read and study where his disciples go, when he really says go to the outermost parts of the earth, they do. Some go to Egypt. That's where the Egyptian Christianity starts. Some go to India. They go all over the world because God, and I know this is hard for some of us, is an incredibly diverse person. The person of Jesus <laughs> And the way he loves other races. I, I do not think you can have a relationship with Jesus and also be racist. Take what you want from that. I don't think you can have a relationship with Jesus and discount other groups of people. I think you have to be able to see them as people who are not only created in the image of God, but are family. Go ahead, Nick. Success. What does success mean to you? Have you ever thought about it? I don't know about you, but I loved these lists because these are all things I had never thought about or questioned about the way I was raised. What does success mean to you? Is it getting into the best schools, making lots of money, getting married and having children? Have you ever met somebody who strived for these goals and made it and they were still miserable? Maybe it's you. You don't have to admit it. But I've strived for some of these things. And I can tell you, when you get there, it's not quite as exciting as you thought it would be. It doesn't fill the hole inside you like you thought it would. There's something very stressful about trying to live up to everyone else's unrealistic expectations for who you were designed to be. All right, last one. Feelings and emotions. You are not allowed to have certain feelings. Your feelings are not important. And reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay. The third one was pretty much how I lived the first 20 years of my life. Reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay. You ever met anybody like that? We call them wild cards in my house. People who come in and everything's going great. And then all of a sudden somebody says something. A story is told. Somebody pokes fun about something and that is it. And they just up, gone. That's it. They're gone. And you, you don't know what happened. You can't resolve anything like that. What were you taught, though, growing up about your feelings and emotions? And how can Jesus reach in and minister to those places inside each of us? I think without taking time to redefine what we see family as, we will all default to every single thing I just listed and went through. We will all default to the way we were raised and the things we've been taught about. You can flip it back, Nick. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, and they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, and they want to see you. And Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. You can come, Missy. I have a question for you today. Very simple, but something I really want you to meditate on all week long. Because when we get back together next Sunday, I'm going to say something and it's the same thing I said today, and it's the same thing I plan to say every Sunday for the rest of the time God gives me the privilege and the right to stand before you. And it is this. Have you found your family? Because if people come into this church and they do not feel loved, they will not stay. If people come in this church and do not feel like they can be part of our family, they won't stay. And this isn't some weird, backhanded regret message. This is I want to be so committed to Jesus that the people who are striving to meet him mean more to me than anything else. I want to feel like when Ruth needs help with something, I'm going to help my mom. I want to feel like when somebody has a need, I don't even hesitate because we're family. 
there's something to be said about having a family. And I'm not talking about just, oh, well, it's nice to have this group of people that support me, or it's nice to go to the same building week after week and get to know people and, oh, that's good. And yeah, they care if I'm there or not. No, I'm talking about family. I'm talking about what would you do for your kid if they called you right now and said, I'm in trouble, I need your help. Because I think the greatest obstacle that we all carry to inviting anyone to church, to talking about Jesus or anything else, is our perspective is wrong. We think if we invite them to church, they'll sit here and they'll listen and it'll be good and that'll be fine. But really the key is not sitting and listening to some sermon. It's coming into a building and feeling like it's a family reunion and feeling like not only is that what it is, but you can be part of it. It's going to someone's house and eating with no agenda other than just to get to know each other. Not, oh, we're going to work through these 12 steps and talk about all these different things that God has in your life. And listen, that stuff will come naturally and organically if you love Jesus. You can't help but talk about him. My challenge for you, my question for you, is when you are placed in an opportunity to share your faith, have you ever considered the fact that you're trying to find your family. And maybe you're not the only one. Maybe they're trying to find their family too. In nine generations, humanity destroyed what God had made perfectly. How many generations to restore it now? How many generations to have Jesus move in our hearts and heal and build up and let some of our guards down and become a little bit more loving, a little bit more accommodating. How many times is he going to have to remind us that he gave everything for us? We don't want to give things for him. How many times are we going to have to wrestle with the Lord and ask ourselves, do I even matter? Some of us have been so beat up and destroyed by things we've gone through in our lives. We, when we think about family, it creates a panic response in us. There's a PTSD that sweeps in. We think about dads that cheated on moms or moms that cheated on dads. We think about abusive parents. We think about brothers and sisters that are a wreck or are doing really well and we can never live up to their situation or their example. Some of us have baggage, big time baggage tied to family. I want to tell you that today... You're part of the family. You serve Jesus, you're part of the family. And if you're part of the family, it means you're loved, you're accepted, and you're wanted and desired. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray that as a church, we would start to shift our focus away from our purposes, our goals, our agendas to yours, that we would start to see people as family, whether they look like us, smell like us, talk like us, think like us, respond like us, react like us, help us to see each other as family. You died to unite us. We are your bride. Nobody wants a bride that is all torn up and disheveled. We need to be unified. We need to be loving and understanding. Help us, I pray, Lord, to get outside of the way we've always thought about things and start to see the world the way you do. Help us, I pray, O oh God, to surrender everything to you, to recognize that we are family and that just as we're brothers and sisters, just as we're mothers and fathers, just as we're sons and daughters, we have something to give to one another. Everybody in this room has value and worth in Jesus' eyes. I ask God that service would no longer be academic. It would no longer be some event that we just attend and sit, but that it would be interactive, that we would be able to say that this is our God and this is our family and we want to just introduce you to him. We thank you for what you're doing here. Help everyone in this room to find their family. In Jesus' name, amen.